Okay, get it right, get it right. You know, as I've been watching the news, of course, the one thing on the news that everyone is talking about is we can't let this ever happen again. Have you all heard that? We can't let this ever happen again. And so the conversation moves towards gun control. And not that I think that's a bad conversation, I don't. However, guns don't kill people. People using guns kill people. And therefore, in order for us to get it right, we need to, as Ernest Holmes says, our job isn't to get facts correct or make the facts work out better. It's to get it right, get it, God, get God in the right place, in the right position. Getting God in the right position means to step into the right thinking. So it's about consciousness, everything. What's the answer to every question? Consciousness. So it's not about how do we get, how do we get less guns into our culture, although that will be good, but it's, but it's more to, what, to the point of what Reverend, Reverend Sharon was talking about. How do we include more people so no one ever feels left out, so no one ever feels alone, so that no one ever feels separate and that's really what I want to talk about today a little bit. You know, today is the last day of Hanukkah, which celebrates the miracle of light. Now, one of the things I have heard over the last few days is about how dark it is and how dark our, our consciousness is right now. But if we address darkness, we really have to address the fact that all darkness is, is the absence of light. So we can, we can fix darkness at any time the minute in a room we just flick on a switch. Therefore, I would think that we could fix the darkness in our mind at any moment by flicking on the light in our mind, yes? So that's what we're here to do today. And as it is with the sun at night, even at night when it's dark, we know the sun is still there, don't we? We know that when we wake up, and in my house, we wake up really early because we're in a glass bedroom, and when you wake up, the sun's up. And so therefore you are too until you grab for your visor and go back to sleep. So it's merely hidden, that's all. So we have been experiencing this darkness, but only because the light seems to be hidden. And that's because we put our attention and our focus on the darkness. And so we don't remember that the light is right there. So today, I would like to shed some light on what is going on in the world. Now that does not mean that I have the ability or the capacity to shed light, meaning understanding, because I don't. I'm not sure how anyone could understand what went on in Connecticut. I'm not sure how anyone could come up with a, in words, an understanding for this that would satisfy. I know that when I was on Facebook, it was, it was everywhere on Facebook and beautiful poems and, and some rantings and anger. But the one that touched me the most, of course, in a personal way to me, was um, my daughters. You know, as a parent, watching this and understanding what it must have felt like for a parent to be standing in that schoolyard waiting to hear, was my child spared? So when I got, saw the Facebook of my daughter who, who wrote this, <sighs> this beautiful posting where she said, it is unfair that so many children will not get to grow up as I will. My heart just broke open. First, being grateful that my daughter was be able to write that. And that she grew up in this congregation and has an understanding of this teaching, which I believe is our greatest capacity, which is to teach our youth, to teach our children love and, 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 and acceptance and understanding. So much so that the world has to change. I love when I was looking at the polls for the same-sex marriage, which by the way, I, I don't even call it that anymore because it's just marriage. Whoever's getting married is getting married. So, but I was looking at the polls and it said that from the ages of, of, of 60, I think it was 60 and up, it was like 87% were against it. From the age of like 20 to 40, 92% or something was for it. And so it's like, oh well, it's just a matter of time, isn't it? <laughs> so it's just a matter of time before we are all going to be able to really embrace one another and stop celebrating our differences 
and start celebrating our oneness. So it's up to us. It's up to a New Thought community like ours to keep the minds focused on the light. And I wrote an email to our practitioners which basically said, I don't want to stop anyone from feeling what they are feeling, but I know that it is my responsibility as a religious science practitioner and minister and certainly pastor of a center to keep my mind focused on the truth, to not allow into my mind. Now, now as you can see, I still have feelings. I feel very deeply about what happened. I have enormous compassion. I even slipped into empathy for a moment. And I know why I'm so against it. Because it doesn't do anybody any good. Because if you find me slipping into empathy, where I start to imagine what it feels like, I am suddenly no good because I am not switching on the light. I am now in the darkness with everybody else. So to the best of my ability, I stayed away from empathy, but my compassion is enormous for what has happened. And my emotions are very, very <laughs> tangible and they're right at the surface. But I know it's up to us to know the truth. That's the gift we have. That's the gift this teaching gives us. It is up to us to know the truth and expand the light. So today my talk is called Turn Towards. Not turn away, but towards. Not in denial. And I want you to get this. Turn towards, not in denial, but in response. So that my response to what's there isn't, I can't look at this. Oh my God, I must look at this. Because I must look at this from the consciousness of truth and spread my light and love on it, not add to the misery. Ernest Holmes and Rita, it's so funny, I had chosen this, and Rita wrote this on her blog this morning. You know, we're being talked, it's being talked a lot about evil. The evil in the world. The evil people. That boy wasn't evil. That boy was God. That man. That 20-year-old man. The shooter. And his name, Adam Lanza. Thank you. And I, I, I bring his name forward just as easily as I would bring any one of those who have passed forward. Because we are all one. And I cannot have anger, and I cannot have hatred, and I cannot contemplate the concept of evil because it's not real. And Ernest Holmes says this, the problem of evil will be met only to the degree that we cease doing evil and doing good. For evil will disappear when we no longer indulge in it. And that means you and me. We no longer indulge in it in our minds. When the whole world sees the right and does it, then, and not until then, will the problem of evil be solved for the entire race. So is there evil in the world? You can call it that. But don't make it an entity. Don't make it something real. Don't make it something that can come at you. Understand that evil is just our use of good. It's the way we use conscious mind. It's the way we use the power. And the same thing for good. It's the way we use it. So, you know, in our classes, we're, we are getting so evolved in our classes. The students are just so, they really push me. And it's good. Because very often they'll say, why do you keep saying God is good? Can you get rid of that word good? It just, if you say good, you have to say bad. Oh my God, that's so true. Oh my God, that is so true. If you say good, you got to say bad. How about useful and not useful? This is useful to me. This is not useful to me. It is not useful to me to sit in darkness. It is useful for me to be bathed in light and know the truth. So, evil? I don't believe in evil. I believe in a use of power that is either constructive or destructive. And we get to choose, don't we? One of my practitioner interns put this on... Um, on the Facebook, and I'm going to read it for you. And this is what she wrote. Now, this practitioner intern, by the way, I don't know if Addie is here, but she is 15 years old, 16 years old. So, practitioner intern, 16 years old. She wrote, this is what I know. I know that nothing can keep love from expressing. I know that beneath all, there is always only love. I know that if I cannot see the love present, I have not looked deep enough. I know that my work in this world is to hold people in their highest and love them no matter what their behavior. I know that behavior 
is a sign of what's inside. If there is joy, there is joyful behavior. If there is pain, there is painful behavior. And she ended there. And then everyone commented on it. This is from a 16-year-old who's grown up in this teaching, who understands this, who understands that it's her job to look inside. So today, in honor of our fearlessness to turn towards, um, I'm going to come to you. As I, as I put together what I was going to do today, what I really understood was that I can't possibly know what to say today. I can't. I, I can know, I can tell you about this science. I can tell you what we teach. I can tell you what I believe. But I can't possibly really know what's in your hearts. I can't know what's in your minds. I can't know what you need unless I ask you. So today, what I decided to do for the last 15 minutes of my time with you, my talk, is to give you an opportunity to tell me what's in your heart and ask me what you want to ask me and give me an opportunity to shed some light on whatever it is you may be thinking or experiencing. And even if you just need to let me know what you're feeling and what you're experiencing, this is your opportunity to do that. Um, are you going to hit me with that light? <laughs> okay, so you'll see me in a spotlight only so the camera can see me. I don't really relish walking around with a spotlight following me. Actually, I do, but... <laughs> there you go. So, I'm going to give the mic to Doug, actually. Uh, actually, Doug, you know what? No, I'll walk to them. You can follow me with the spot, right? I'd like to come to you. So, um, this is your opportunity today to ask any questions about science of mind, about religious science, about new thought. Tell me what you're feeling. Tell me what you want to know. Tell me, tell me where it hurts, <laughs> and I can help. So, raise your hand, and I... Yes? Of course. The last person in the last row. Perfect. <laughs> come down towards me. Come into the light. Navy veteran, and I got laid off a of Cartoon Network, and I need you to help me to understand what Ernest Holmes says, when we learn to trust the God of the universe, we shall be happy, prosperous, and well, because I have filled out resumes and job applications and haven't heard from anybody, and I studied, I took Science of Mind 1 and 2, I also took Unity classes, I even took recapitulation from from what, when I was raised in Christian science and I went on to unity and religious science. And I need to have a whole complete understanding to know that evil is neither person, place, nor thing and that I cannot be a victim of poverty and rejection because I put in applications everywhere and don't hear from anybody. Great. Thank, tell me your name. David Lieberhart. David Lieberhart. Thank you. Lieb Lieberhart? Yeah, I'm a past actor from the Tim and Eric Awesome Show. Great job. Great job. Okay. So, um, you brought up a couple things. One, you brought up the idea of being a victim, which is something I definitely want to address. Um, in what we teach is that there's no such thing as a victim, because we are always, always equal to our experience now. In a day like today, saying I'm equal to my experience can be really difficult, not only to hear, but to comprehend. What I would ask you, David, is to Really check your heart to see what you really, truly, absolutely believe about what's going on. It's very easy for all of us to get, to get drawn into the facts of our lives, especially when they become so horrific as this weekend, or in your case, what you're going through right now. And we've all, everybody here have challenges? Okay, so your job is, are you willing to take your attention off of the challenge and into a truthful understanding? especially science of mind 100, 200 unity classes, he really brings up something interesting. It doesn't matter how many classes you have, have taken. It doesn't matter how much knowledge you have. This isn't about how much knowledge can we glean, how, much, how many credits can we get, how many certificates can we get, how, many, how, many, how much can we gather. It's not about that. It has to be about how much has really taken root, how much has really stepped into our heart. So my, my answer to you would be, the more you will allow yourself and actually commit yourself to focusing on those principles that you studied and finding out how much of that you believe, I believe and I know that whatever I create in my life, I create because I have created it in my mind first. As Ernest Holmes said, it's in your mind first and then it shows up. So I would say to you, David, do not lose faith. 
Faith is the very thing that will make one of those resumes land on the exact right desk. And the person that you had no idea finds it and says, oh, this is who I'm looking for. And you must know that and you must believe that because it's just too easy to focus on the other. You're welcome. Yes, John. Oh, John Gill. John Gill. Well, this you can is, take it. What, what, I'm, what I'm grappling with is this, stopping this from happening. What can we do with the person who's decided they're going to kill themselves? They're out. They've made that decision. And then they're going to take 25 children with them. Um, what, what can, I mean, there is nothing we can do in a penal code. There's nothing we can do. I, I, what I'm grappling with is, you know, okay, so we assign the death penalty to murder, and that's supposed to make people stop wanting to do it. Um, what can we do with the person that's already assigned the death penalty to themselves? What can we do with, you know, the ultimate, the ultimate nasty punishment we can give them? They've already taken on. So we, uh, obviously, the, the penal code isn't, isn't it. Obviously, what we have set up as our society, as our answer to crime, isn't it. And so I'm, I'm grappling with, you know, what do we do to take this person and make them think, oh, no, I can't do that because, because what? Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you, Gil. Okay, so, so the answer can't be how can we punish people so that they won't do it in the first place. It, it never will be, as you said. It just, that's not the point. I think we as a society have spent a very lo a lot of time trying to answer this question. First of all, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know. I don't know. Yes, I do. I do know how we stop this. I don't know what we do with those people, individuals right now who may feel this way, but I know how we stop a generation from feeling this way. I know that we create a society that is so much more interested in the good we do than the bad we do. I know that we create a society that is so much more interested in loving one another than finding fault with one another. I know that we create a society that begins in the home where parents teach their children that love is the only answer in every situation. I know that when we create a world like that, when we create a world from that place, then anyone who has an idea that seems a little off or someone who's lonely or sad, whatever is going on in their mind, that, they, there's, it, that as close as can be to them is someone whose love overshadows that. And I think right now we're living in a world where we have a very divisive mentality for the most part, and many people are sharing their differences rather than their similarities. So I honestly believe that, you know, we can keep, we can keep giving stricter, stricter penalties. We can, we can start creating buildings that are so impossible to get into, everyone feels like they're in jail. I don't know about you, but, you know, Kevin and I were talking about this recently. Um, yeah, we live in Studio City, and yet we still have to think, when our children go out the front door to ride their bikes, we still have to think. I didn't think, did any of you think when you were little? My parents, I left the house in the morning, they didn't see me till dinner, and we're very happy about that. <laughs> How many of you had that for your experience? Yes, our children aren't living in a world like that anymore, are they? Nora and Will go out on their bikes, and I literally say, I need you to call me in five minutes on your cell phone. And Nora's like, Dad, really? I'm like, really? You know, we pick them up, and there's the, 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 the car crunches at school, to pick up your children is, is, is so overwhelming because everyone wants to pick their child up right at the school door. Get in the car, we're going home. You know, my children go to a school they could walk home from, and I wouldn't even dream of letting them walk home from school. I'll let them walk to the nearest Starbucks to pick them up because I see the trail of people. But even Kevin and I argue about that. Kevin's like, I don't even like them walking to Starbucks. And I get it. So it's not about, Gil, I don't think we can keep being the society that keeps trying to put more and more armor in front of us to protect us. In fact, I think we need to do 
more and more work to get rid of the armor so that what's inside always protects us because it's God that protects me and my children. It's God, the love of God, that protects them at all times. And when everyone really gets that and knows that and starts to expand on that, I think we'll live in a different world. And that's what I want. I want to live in a different world. And that means the world of conscious truth. Yes. Hi, Ty. Ty? Yes. Hi, Ty. James. James. Um, I, um, I, I walked right up the edge of suicide about 20 years ago and wanted out of here. And uh, it, 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 the, the learning that came from that transformed my whole view of, of life. Um, because at, at the time I was just transitioning into becoming a hypnotherapist, which is what I am now. And, and I, my work is taking people into the future, into the brightest possible future. And what I realized when I was on the edge of killing myself, and, and I, I, it wasn't that difficult to do, it was a very real option. And what I realized was that it wasn't about my past, it wasn't about the pain of what's going on in my life at the time, which was a horrendous divorce and, and career crisis and everything, everything falling apart. But what I realized was that it was because my future was so dark and I had no hope to look forward to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I didn't want to stay. I didn't want another 30, 40, 50 years of, of pain. I'd already done enough of that. And so I realized that my choice to commit suicide I, I used to, before that day, I thought people who even thought about suicide were sick. There was something wrong with them. There was something really defective. And I realized, no, I'm like totally normal. I just, my future sucks and I don't want to be here for it. Mm -hmm. Changed my whole view that led to my career now where I, I help people create a bright future. So as this happened this week, the, the thing that I've been looking at is, the, and what you were just talking about, our, our kids and the the way they live and the way my daughter's 27 and, and, and she grew up here in, in Sherman Oaks and the way we live our lives right now the future for most people on the planet is terrifying mm. if it's not global warming then it's the nukes from North Korea and if it's not that then it's Studio mm -hmm. City mm -hmm. and whatever is going to happen mm -hmm. but if you look as you're saying look for the real truth the real truth is that the, the future is getting more and more beautiful every single day. There are solutions to every single problem. Already, there's an incredible book called Abundance. The future is better than you think. Mm. And it's awesome. It's about every area of life, and the problems are already being solved. Technology is already solving food and energy and health and, and communication. The world is getting brighter, and our, our kids are going to grow up and then the, the change world. it all yes 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 so there is a beautiful future coming the problem with that is and i've been doing this for 20 years talking to people about the future it, just ask yourself how many people in the world what percentage of the population do you think can imagine a really bright future for the whole world well that's it isn't it for the whole world the whole world not just me and my family not just me but the whole world we don't yeah. win until everybody wins that's Particularly right. mothers know that. Us men who are waking up. Well, I consider myself that. a mother. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So, so the, the thing that we can do that we can change literally right now today, what I've found is that less than 1% of the population of this planet can even imagine the world working. So then we have... Our jobs cut out for us. Yes. And that's Imagine good. a world that works for everyone. For everyone. Oh my God, it's you know that's our happen. vision statement. No, I don't. A world that works for everyone. Oh, cool. I, I knew why I called on John you. John invited me here, and, uh, and I'm very grateful. Thank you, John. Very happy Thank to you be so here. Much. That's that Thank, Thank you so much. That's terrific. Thank you. Thank you so much. See, you just let spirit do the job, and it's perfect. Um, you're really right. I mean, you know, when you hit some percentages, you know, my, my mind goes into a less than 1%, you know, think that think about a world for everyone. You know what? That my first thought is, wow, that's daunting. No, it's not daunting. There is no big or small in the mind of God that maketh all. So we may have our work cut out for us, but it's wonderful work. It's challenging work. And I believe that we can do, do you believe you can do this. 
Do you believe that perhaps your grandchildren, maybe my grandchildren, which won't come along for quite a while, I hope, um, that our grandchildren can start going out and we're not going to be you know, vigilant watching them, worrying about them. We'll know the truth that they're safe. Yes. Paul? Very brief, but just to piggyback on what Gil was saying, this morning on the Huffington Post, there was an amazing article from a mother of a mentally ill child. One of the most heartbreaking things I've ever read. With this teaching, what I am most conscious of is that I have, and when I do my treatments, I always say that I am, when I get to the gratitude part, I always say that I'm grateful for my consciousness, I'm grateful for my awareness. In this particular situation that happened on Friday, I don't believe it's evil. I believe it's somebody who does not have control of their thoughts. So how would Ernest Holmes and Science of Mind explain people in this world that cannot get control of their thoughts in order to stop themselves from doing something like this? Well, I believe we go back to our original truth, which is that there's only one mind. And that you know, when we do spiritual mind treatment, first of all, let me go back for a second. I saw on the news this morning someone talking about uh, this concept of, well, he had Asperger's or he was um, uh, autistic. And they had, a, they had someone on there to, let, to shed some light on this and it was brilliant because he said, do we really want to ascribe this behavior to a, something that so many people have? And do we really want to ascribe this behavior and turn those other people with this particular thing into a possibility of this? And the answer is no at all. So I love that they're coming forth and making sure that we don't go into that trap, right. number one. Which, by the way, the trap always is the blame game, isn't it? We want to blame something as opposed to understand it. And frankly, I don't know that we'll ever understand it. And that's why I think people blame. If I can't understand it, I'm going to blame someone. I'll at least get even. I'll at least this will actually, we will make it make sense. Can't we be comfortable at the moment living with, we can't understand this, but we can understand how to change it. And as you're saying, someone who doesn't seem to have control of their mind, Ernest Holmes actually taught in the science of mind about consciousness. Consciousness is always aware. You may not know what they know. They may not know what you know. We may not think the same way. We may not process the same way. But frankly, when you step back and step back, and I'll fall right over, step back and step back, you will always be at the same mind your brother or sister is with because that's the idea of oneness. We will always be part of the one mind. And I can know, and when I do treatment for any of you, when I work with you, I am stepping into that place where we are equal and one, where the infinite is possible. And when I know the truth from there, it affects your mind too. And it will affect any mind. I refuse to believe there is any mind on this planet that cannot be touched, that cannot be healed, that cannot know the truth when I know the truth. One in, what's that, what's that thing? What's that? Uh, uh, it's a great quote. One in, one, not in unity. No, one alone in consciousness is with the, in, one alone in consciousness with the infinite constitutes a complete majority. Did you all get that? Did you get that through my 10 times of trying to say it? One alone in unity with the divine constitutes a complete majority. So that's what I know, okay? Um, yes, and I think I only have time for one more. Um, well, I just want to say that one thing I am optimistic about is the fact that how people raise children is improving over the years. I mean, when I was growing up, it was completely acceptable to just grab your allegedly disobedient child and hit him. Yep. You know, and I saw it, I certainly experienced it. Um, and they don't see that anymore. And uh, there's enough research to understand that there is a direct link between how children are treated and violence later on. Mm -hmm. There's, I mean, that's people in prison, that's almost a reoccurring theme. They're always abused, people that are incredibly violent. So, um, and I've experienced that myself in my own life. So um, I, that gives me hope that that it's just, it's not cool to hit kids anymore. It's not cool to talk down to them and treat them like they're little, you know, messy pets or something. Mm -hmm. So, messy um, pets. You know, so um, it's, uh, that, that's a, a, a great improvement and hopefully that type of mentality will go around the rest of the world yep. and we won't have a lot of these problems like we have. Great, so. thank you. And I want to say this about that. Um, 
I grew up in a violent age too. My father was a policeman and all he knew to, to discipline us was to hit. And it was a very violent childhood and a lot of beatings took place, you know. And I, I'm laughing now. Uh, I have great compassion for that man, what he must have had to feel doing it. I do. I understand it in a different way now. Um, and just as a humorous aside, you know, when we were flying somewhere with my son, this is going to prove your point, he was jumping over the back seat trying to talk to the person behind him, and I, all I did was I literally t patted him on his butt to get him down, and he whipped around and went at the top of his lungs on the plane. You hit me! <laughs> and I thought to myself, I am so glad he thinks that is a hit. <laughs> I'm so glad that that is so obscure for him in his relationship to me. And I just said, I said, oh, okay, I'm sorry, I was just trying to get your attention. He was like, well, get it another way. So he was right. Carl, one last one. Uh, I was a child of the of the Big Depression, and uh, um, really, you're that old? Yeah, I'm okay. much older than that. Okay. <laughs> anyway, well, I had all the structure that a child was supposed to be taught, which I loved. You know, which gave me things that wouldn't hurt me, and you know what what you're really supposed to teach children. And I wasn't abused or anything, but we had uh, uh, we had a government at that time that we felt that was trying to help us out of the depression, and I think I think. Uh, uh, with our beliefs plus taking action, which, which is action is a magic word in it, I think if we forced our so-called leaders to get together so the people, I think the people feel disenfranchised, I think they feel lost, and I think they feel hopeless, and I think they feel angry. If they can't get together, we don't have the security I think that we used to have. That's where I come from. Okay, good. Well, it's interesting you should say that because on the list serve, the minister's list serve, there has been back and forth for the last two days this whole thing about action. And it has been, you know, there, there have been two lines of thinking. There was the old school, which is the, I'll say the old school, but the, there was one line of thinking which was all we need to do is stand in truth and everything will change. And then there was another line of thinking which said, no, once we know the truth, we must take action, thus change occurs. And you can only imagine which side of that argument I stood on. And I made myself pretty well known that this is what I thought and that it was time to stand up and take action. However, one thing I will say, Carl, I don't think we could ever force anyone to do anything. And in fact, I think it's important that take action doesn't mean a hostile takeover. A hostile or an angry takeover, forcing people to man up, forcing people to change their mind, they won't. But I do think that if you put those two things together, now you have real action. I believe in love. I believe that every person on this planet deserves the right to marry. And I will put my mouth and my money and my action in that. But only because I believe that it's something that everyone deserves which doesn't mean I'm going to argue down anyone's belief that they don't believe in it. I also respect their right to have a problem with it. That's their right. So there is a way to go at this, and there is a way to take action of this. And in, in what we're talking about this morning, a world that works for everyone, it almost sounds kind of fairy dust stuff. You know, a world that works. How could a world work for everyone? The only, way away, the only way this world will work for everyone is if everyone decides to respect everyone's right to have a life that they wish to live that does not interfere with anyone else's. That's how we have a world that works for everyone. And so what that means is we have to be willing, each and every one of us in this room, we have to be willing to start minding our minds. And that's how I want to close this this morning. Every single person in this room has the most powerful tool imaginable to create change, and it's your mind. And every single thing that you entertain in your mind creates something. And what you create from the thoughts that come through your mind are attached to some belief that you have in your heart. So when you hear yourself thinking negatively about your neighbor, when you hear yourself blaming people, when you hear yourself dissatisfied, disgruntled, angry, upset, just stop for a moment. As Michael Singer says in The Untethered Soul, stop for a moment and step back. 
Allow it to continue. Don't fight it because what we resist persists. But step back for a moment. Allow yourself to feel what you're feeling. Think what you're thinking. Do what you're doing. But step back enough that you can watch it and get an understanding of it. And then you can create in your mind exactly what you need to create. Know what you need to know to do the changing that you wish to do. To create the world around you that you want. It all comes back to each and every one of us. And we're here this morning to clear away, to just get rid of, to, to, to throw away the darkness, to shove out the darkness. So that doesn't mean that you should push back inside all of your feelings. In fact, it's the exact opposite. It means it's time to start feeling what you feel. I cry. I cry. I get sad. I have emotions and feelings about things that happen. I'm disappointed at times. I understand all of this. And I allow it to come up. Because guess where I don't want it? Back inside of me. I don't want to walk around this planet, as I think many people do, just this human vehicle for collecting all of the things that I didn't like in the world, all of my disappointments, all of my uh, failures, or even all of my successes. I don't want to be that thing that walks around feeling, I mean, not feeling anything. God is all there is. Everything's fine. God is all there is. Everything's fine. And inside, I'm dying. I'd rather just let it out. No, preferably I like to let it out in the privacy of my own home <laughs> and not with everyone I meet. Because frankly, that's not letting it out. When I tell you, when I share it with everyone I meet, I'm growing it. Every time I share it again, oh my God, do you know what happened to me? Boom, 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 and now it grows. And then you say, oh, I'm so sorry about that, and it's pushed back in, and I've got it again. Only it's bigger this time. So when I get to the next person, I have a better big story. So that's what our job is. That's who we are as religious scientists. A world that works for everyone first has to be a world that works for you. And if it's going to be a world that works for you, that means everything in your world you need to make sense out of, spiritual, logical sense. Know the truth and allow it to be whatever it is, but then step back in with the truth. So that's my, that's my knowing for you this morning, that each person here has the opportunity to walk out of here this morning feeling what you feel, but more importantly, knowing what you know. A world that works for everyone starts with a world that works for you and a world that works for me. So I just want you to think about that. And I don't want um, any applause here this morning, and I want to bring the band back up and bring Doug back up and everybody, because I want you to just stay in thought. So come on back up, everyone. Thank you for sharing your feelings this morning. And I know there's a lot of you that raised your hand I didn't get to. I'd like to do one of these someday where I'm not time constricted.